Well, good morning again. I'm excited to be here. It's been a few weeks since I've uh, been able to be on the stage and, and preaching, but I know that uh, Brandon has done uh, just an amazing job of opening our eyes to uh, common unity, of showing us uh, what true community is. Now, one of the bad uh, kind of pitfalls at times of letting other pastors up on stage is at times they call you out. And Brandon uh, called me out last week about my uh, heritage, my Jewish heritage, so I thought I'd bring my great-grandfather's uh, yarmulke Today, I'm just kidding, it's not really my great-grandfather's yarmulke. Um, if, if you were to ask my mom what, what, what I am, I'm a Choctaw Chickasaw Jew, so uh, I'm more a Samaritan than Jewish. Uh, but, but the reality of it is, I was, I was thinking about the, the yarmulke this week and um, just the, the, the beauty of it and what it really represents. Whenever um, a Jew would take a yarmulke and they would place it on their head, what they were doing was they were preparing their hearts for worship. They were covering their heads for prayer. They were making sure that they were set apart so that others would see that and they would know that they stood for God. And, and as I was kind of just looking and, and, and reading into that, that, that fact and that reality, I was reminded that we as believers in Christ are also set apart, right? We're set apart so others can see the truth of Christ in us. So that others can see a life that is lived for his glory, a life uh, that, that is transformed by the power of the resurrection. And, and if we're really going to be the church and what God has called us to be, then, then we have to live that way, right? I, I love the quote that Brandon shared last week uh, by J.D. Greer, how involved should I be in church? To the extent that you want the power of God to be active in your life. That's how involved you should be in the church, in the mission of the church. And when we talk about the church, what we're talking about is a movement, right? It's not just a building. It's not uh, just a group that comes in and gathers. Really, it's uh, people who are called out for Christ, uh, people who are called out to go out into the world and to share their faith and to make sure they do. And that's one reason that we've changed the uh, title of community groups is because we want to take our groups, we want to take our mission out into the community. We want to begin to share our faith. This great movement of God comes about as we who have seen the glory, right? We who have experienced firsthand how Christ has transformed and changed our life. We take that good news uh, and we pray and we ask God to seek us. And then we personally share that good news. We pour our lives into the lives of those around us, those that we encounter and so as I was kind of thinking about the whole concept of the yarmulke, I was thinking about the challenge that we have as believers to make sure that others don't just uh, at times hear our faith, but they truly see our faith, right? They truly see how we're living it. But in order for them to know that it's faith, we still have to what? We still have to talk about it. We can't just uh, expect everyone to look, oh, look, they're doing good deeds. Obviously, it's Jesus. No, we have to tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so my prayer today as we kind of go into this is that we would look and see how we can be uh, a greater influence in our community, how we can come together in small groups and then reach out because that's really the purpose, right? We're a uh, sent people. So as we kind of dive into this this morning, we open in prayer with me today. God, we ask you today to fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. God, I ask today that you would get me out of the way and that you would truly speak to our hearts, God, that you would open our hearts to who you are, God. God, some of us have been blinded by the pain of this world and the heartache of this world, and maybe we're a little skeptical of, of really stepping into church and really stepping into um, a community group, God. Maybe we've been hurt by other believers, God, and that's the reality of it is, is that we all sin and fall short, God. But I pray today that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and there would be a healing that would take place in each of us, God. God, first that we would see our great need for you, because without you, we can do nothing. But through your power, God, we can take the good news to the world, and that's what we want to do. So we ask you to speak to our hearts and challenge us today to live for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. If you've got your Bibles or your uh, devices, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be at, in Acts chapter 1, then we're going to dive over into Ephesians. But I just want to build on the whole concept of community and uh, the power of really truly being in a life group or being in the church and a part of the church. The book of Acts is the account of the work of the Holy Spirit, right? It's the account of the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through the lives of believers, 
That's the whole record of Acts. This is how the gospel was spread to the ends of the earth. Followers of Christ proclaiming the good news of Jesus by the power of Christ with others, making sure that they were discipling them. They were coming alongside them and they were encouraging them and they were raising them up and leading them to make other disciples. And that's one of the most beautiful aspects, I think, of community groups is how we sharpen one another and we encourage one another, we lead one another. I was speaking with a couple this week and uh, our group hasn't met most of the summer, but we were talking about how much they've missed that time of just coming together and fellowshipping and just encouraging one another. And it's almost like this breath of fresh air in the middle of the week, looking towards the weekend and getting that power. But the reality of it is we can walk in that daily. And that's what God calls us to walk in, right? A relationship with him daily. But we can never do this in our own power. You see, we need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. We are to live, as Paul would say, in his strength, right? We struggle, and we have hardship, and this world at times is a broken place, and there's a a lot of things that we face that maybe dissuade us or move us uh, away from God's will, but the reality of it is, is that Christ has already overcome this world. And so we have hope in him, and we can rely on him, and we can cling to him, and we can trust him. And the Gospel of Luke records all that Jesus had begun. You know, as we look at the book of Luke, we see all the miracles that Christ did and how he both began to reach and and proclaim the truth of the kingdom. And he would call people to repent because the kingdom was near, and he would move them in this direction. But Luke also, who wrote Acts, tells us what Jesus continued to do. He continued to do and teach through his spirit and through the church, through us. So today as we dive into the word and we look at this book of Acts, I want you to be reminded of this, is that you are a continuation of the work of Christ. You are a continuation of the work of Christ. He is continuously working in and through us to transform this world, to bring the good news of the gospel to it. Look with me at Acts chapter 1. It says, "In in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was still alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift My father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now the reality today is that the church exists for the mission of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, right? We didn't form the church uh, to to start a mission, right? We didn't form and go, okay, now what are we going to do? No, you see, the church was formed because there was already a mission in place, Jesus wanted the world to know the truth of who he was, all uh, about the grace and the power and the might of God, how God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross in our place and give us hope and give us life. And the disciples, they were expected, they were expected to take that good news to the world around him. The church exists for the mission of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Christ, you are a part of the church, and you are still here because there's a mission for your life. God has called you to take the good news to the world. See, as the disciples were gathered there with Jesus, they were expecting him to do stuff. And after his resurrection, Jesus remained with them here on earth for 40 days, ministering to them, teaching them, uh, encouraging them, growing in this. Uh, interaction was a foreshadowing of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, because this is the way that it pretty much went. The disciples would go about their day, and then suddenly Jesus would appear, and he would teach them, and he would encourage them, and he was gone, right? Then he would disappear. He would appear somewhere else, and he would move from place to place, and he would uh, appear event after event and thing after thing. And it was like this foreshadowing of what was going to happen in the Holy Spirit and how he was going to fill us and lead us and guide us. Jesus would show up in power. He would show up in the upper room whenever Thomas was doubting, right? When he was questioning whether he was even risen, he would say, look, here I am. If you want to check for yourself, check the scars in my hands, check my side, understand that I am risen. 
And then Christ gave us the Holy Spirit who fills us with his presence. You see, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to what? To, to push forth Christ, to proclaim Christ, to make sure that we see and understand the power of his resurrection. And the church exists for the mission of sharing the good news. In verse 6, the disciples gathered around Christ and they asked him this question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, this was a, an interesting question. The disciples expected Jesus to do something amazing next, right? I mean, after all, he had risen from the dead, right? He had, he had come back to life. He was crucified, he was dead, he was buried, and then he was raised to a new life. And then he starts showing up and all this stuff. And they're expecting this great just uh, revival, right? This restoration of Israel. But that's not really what happens. See, they say, Lord, what are you going to do next? We're ready to go. We're excited. But his reply that surprised them, it surprised them. Because he says in verse 7, he said, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up in a cloud before their very eyes. From their sight. Lord, what are you going to do next? Hold on. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything yet. Just wait. I'm going to send my spirit to feel you. And you're going to be my witnesses. You see, anytime you see the feeling of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, you see it in Luke, you see it in Acts. Those who were filled with the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They proclaimed Christ, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit, they begin to preach, they begin to, to teach, they begin to share the truth of Christ. Those filled with the Holy Spirit couldn't help but proclaim the name that is above every name. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we can't help but tell others about Christ. We can't help but go out and begin to share that truth and the grace and the power and the love that he's done. We can't help but long for others to experience that for themselves. Our mission for God moves in an inside-out direction, right? It starts inside of us where Christ saves us and sets us free. It starts in me and it starts in you. And if it hasn't happened in us, it's never going to happen outside of us, right? It's never going to happen through us. It begins in our heart. It begins with God changing us. And it all starts with God, right? The calling of God as he begins to speak to our heart and begins to lay on our hearts the desire for us to truly know him. God would say that no one comes to Christ unless he calls them, right? He moves us, and as he moves us in that direction, then we see our great need for him, and then we fall on our feet and we begin to worship him. And it all starts with God and his great love for us. He reveals his truth to us. He fills us with the power of his Holy Spirit, and we respond to him in belief and action. We begin to tell others the good news. But see, here's the thing is, we can't tell others the good news unless we what? Experience the good news for ourselves. You guys ever try to tell a story about something uh, and you weren't even there? And the person that was actually there is next to you? Y'all ever try that? I probably do that to my wife all the time. My wife will probably have a story or somebody will have a story around me. And I'm like, hey, you need to know what happened to her. Let me tell you all about this. And I'm all telling the story and everything else. And she's like, that's, that's not really the way it went, Robbie. You know, that's not really what happened. And I'm like, no, no, it really happened like this. And really, No, we have to experience it for ourself. We have to know the power of his resurrection. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the greatest questions, if not the greatest question we have to ask ourselves. Have I truly experienced the grace of God? Because if we haven't, we're not transformed. We're not changed. We're not renewed. And, and there's a lot of people that are going about pretending to be believers in Christ, and they haven't been filled with the Spirit of Christ. I love what Spurgeon says. Charles Spurgeon says that every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. 
That's pretty harsh, right? But it's true, right? We're either a missionary, we're either on mission for God, making sure that others see and know and understand the truth, or maybe we don't really believe what we claim to believe. We've either been transformed by the power of Christ and our hearts and lives have been turned upside down by all that he's done for us, or we're just playing a game. This is a deadly game because the game leads to hell. If your life hasn't truly been changed, if the message hasn't truly captured your heart, then maybe you need to step back and say, wait a minute, who's running my life? Who's really in charge? Is it me or is it God? You see, the message captures our hearts. And it captured their heart. And because we're captivated by the good news, we will willingly go anywhere that he calls us. We will give up everything that hinders us. And we will do whatever it takes for his glory to be revealed in and through our lives. See, that's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, look at it right there in Acts 1 verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to what? The ends of the earth. Whenever the power of Christ comes into our life and it changes us, it sets us free from sin and shame. And because that power changes us, because it moves in us, we can't help but shout it from the highest hill, right? We can't help but see it and live it. But how easily the world comes in and begins to distract us, right? How easily even at times other Christians are like, whoa, 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 settle down. You're making us look bad because you're so on fire for Jesus. But what if we were all on fire for Christ like we're supposed to be? What if we were truly more than conquerors? What if we truly didn't look at the things of this world and see them as the end result and we saw eternity for what it is? Christ in us, the hope of glory, right? You see, the message has to capture our heart. We have to completely surrender our lives to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Witnesses share an account right? Witnesses share an account. Whenever uh, someone is called into witness, they share an account, right, of what they've seen, of what they've heard, or what they've experienced. They're talking about something that has happened to them. They're not necessarily talking about what they're going to do. They're talking about, wait a minute, I've already, it's already happened, right? And if we're to witness to others, what we're to tell them is like, hey, I was lost in sin. I was dead and headed to hell, and Christ gave me life. See, we may claim not to have much of a testimony, but we have the greatest testimony of all time if we were lost and now we're found. That's all we have to share. The good news that God saw us in the deepness of our sin, and yet he still loved us. And at just the right time, while we were still, what, ungodly, while we were still broken, while we were still in rebellion against him, Christ died for us. And that's the mission that we take forward. What we've seen. What have you seen of God in your life? What we've heard. What have you heard about Christ in your life? What we've experienced. Have you truly experienced the power of Christ? If you haven't, you can do that today because Christ said that all you that come to me, right, I'll give you rest. I'll give you strength. I'll give you peace. I will heal you. His word says that if we call upon the name of the Lord, believe in our heart, right, that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will what? Be saved. Our lives can be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, here's the reality of this. It's the work of Christ in us that changes us. And disciples were looking around and they were thinking, okay, Lord, what, what are you going to do next? What, what, what do you have in store? What, what's, what's the process? What's this going to totally look like? What are you going to do? And he says, hey, there's some things that we're worrying about that we need to stop worrying about. Like, when is the world going to end? Don't worry about that. When am I coming back? Guess what? Don't really worry about that. Know it's going to happen because I said it's going to happen. But don't worry about that. You see, what you need to worry about is that you are being my witnesses. 
Are you telling everyone that you can about the good news of Jesus Christ? See, Jesus didn't answer their question. He says, listen, this isn't over, okay? Right, I'm going to go up in heaven, and I'm going to keep working, right? I'm going to send my spirit, and he's going to fill you, and you guys are going to continue to be my witnesses. I'm going to fill you with my spirit, and I'm going to use you for my glory. I'm going to proclaim the good news to the lost and dying world through you who are broken people, you who are hope. I mean, never in the world have we seen such a great task given to, right, such a, an unexpected group of people, right? That kind of gives us hope. Because it's not us, it's the power of Christ working in and through us. And this is a big deal. Because this is what we're all called to do. Now, I love this because it says right here that after he gives them these words, that he what? He ascends into heaven, that he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight, right? I mean, can you imagine that? Okay, God, what's next? Okay, Jesus, what are you going to do next? We know you've risen from the dead, and now we're ready for the kingdom to come, and we're ready to do everything for you. And he's like, okay, this is what I want you guys to do. I want you guys to go and pray. And in a little while, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill you with my spirit. And then you're going to go and you're going to share the good news. What? That, that's not what we really expected. We expected you to say. Now, now, as he does that, right, he starts floating in the air, right? And he floats and he floats. And they're just like, wait a minute, where are you going? What are you doing? What's going on here? Wait a minute. Why are you doing this? And suddenly a cloud covers and he's gone and they're left there, right, with their kind of jaws hanging. What just happened? Are we on our own? See, I think that's the part of witnessing that we struggle with the most, is this thought that whenever I witness to somebody or I tell the good news that I'm on my own. You're never on your own. It's the Holy Spirit that fills us. Listen to this. As they're sitting there looking up intently into the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And then the apostles, they return to Jerusalem. And in verse 14, it says, they all join together constantly in prayer. And right, he names all of the apostles, right? They go back and they gather in what? A a small group, right? A community group. And they begin to what? They begin to pray. They begin to pray. And what does he say? Hey, wait. Wait until my spirit fills you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a good waiter. Anybody in here a good wait? You like to wait on things? I'm not, I'm not very patient at times. I don't really like to wait on things to happen. I want to see things happen, and especially if it's something that I want. And the reality is, is when we're called to wait, we either give up or we go ahead of God in our waiting. See, there's, there's power in waiting. And the greatest way that we can wait is in prayer. Are you wanting to see God do something great in you? Are you wanting to see God do something powerful in you? You see, prayer is actively waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. It's waiting for the Holy Spirit to, to work in us. And uh, if we're not a praying church, if we're not a church that is sitting on our knees and saying, God, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? How do you want to lead us? Fill us with your power. You go before us, God. You come behind us. You go in us. You surround us with your presence. If we're not constantly praying and moving in that direction, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss what he has in store. One of my favorite people in the Bible is Paul, and Paul is probably next to Christ and next to uh, probably King David, maybe one of the people that we read more prayers about than anybody else. When he couldn't fully convey a message to others, when, when he couldn't fully maybe translate and, and get the point across of what he was wanting to tra- say, he what? He prayed for the Holy Spirit to intercede and to open other people's eyes. When he was in prison, what did he do? He he prayed. When he was shipwrecked, he prayed. When he was beaten, he prayed. When he was bitten by a snake, he prayed. I mean, you get the point, right? He always prayed. He made sure that prayer was 
the point and the focal point of what he did. And here's the, the reason that he prayed. You see, Paul didn't want anyone to miss out on the good news of Jesus Christ. So he prayed for them. Bless you. He prayed blessings over them. He didn't, he didn't want others to lose heart. He wanted them to miss the calling that God had placed on his life, so he prayed. He understood the importance of waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer. And that's why we gather into small groups and we pray. That's why we gather as a community of believers and we pray. Look with me at, at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 real quickly. This is a prayer by Paul for the, for the church there at Ephesus. You see, prayer and waiting are not simple passive verbs, right? They're filled with action. They're filled with action. Waiting and, and praying are filled with action. And so today, as we kind of close out, I want to I show you a few things about prayer that I think are going to be real important for us to truly see and the power of God work in and through our church. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3, starting verse 14. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth de derives its, na its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the, his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. You see, when we pray, God calls, and we respond with obedience. God is always calling us. God is always speaking to our heart. The question is, are we actually listening? When we pray, we're listening, right? We're, we're listening to that call. We're listening to what he has, and we respond with obedience. Paul says there, here that whenever he prays, he bows his head in worship. See, this is our truest response to God's calling. In humility, surrender, and obedience, we place our lives completely on the altar of living as a living sacrifice, right? The gospel message turns our lives upside down, and we gladly accept that and whatever it's going to take to make sure that we take that gospel to others. You see, those who know the power of the gospel, they live in that power, right? They live in the might of what Christ has done for them. Listen to what John says in 1 John 1, 2, and 3. He says, he says this, The life appeared, speaking of Jesus, and we have seen it, and we have testified to it, and we proclaim to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship with the, fa with his, with the Father and his, with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, this is our response. This is our witness. We've seen with our own eyes and we've been transformed by the creator of all things. We've been set free by the power of his resurrection. The word of life lives in us, right? It begins to move through us. We belong to him. We're called by him and we respond to him. When we pray, he calls to us and we respond in obedience. Look at me at verse 16 and 17. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. When we pray, God speaks and we're empowered. God speaks and we're empowered. What does that mean? Well, how did God speak the entire universe into existence, Right? That's what he did, right? He spoke the words and everything came into existence. And whenever he speaks into our hearts, a life is born. We are made new. He breathes new life into us. You see, the strengths and the gifts that only God can give, they come according to his power and might. And he begins to move in and through us. But here's a reality. You see, in and of ourselves alone, we can never do anything of lasting value. 
I can never do anything of lasting value, right? Everlasting value. What I do is one day going to fade away. What you do is one day going to fade away. But if Christ is in us, it has what? It has lasting value, everlasting value. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is Christ at work in our innermost being, transforming us and making us new, not just around us, but us experiencing it for ourselves in our hearts. And that all comes, what, through faith. Paul would say in Ephesians 2, 9 through 10, that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, right? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance. I love that passage. I love that passage because it speaks two truths. Number one, it speaks that I don't have to save myself. It's the power of God that sets me free. So knowing that I'm going to fail and I'm going to make mistakes doesn't matter because it's God who never fails that saves me. And not only that, that me, who at times feels useless, am gonna be, are going to be used by God, right? My, my grammar's terrible, but, but God is powerful. And he works in and through us. But it, it takes strength, right? It takes strength for us to understand this and walk with this. And we have to begin to walk in God's love. Why does it take strength to comprehend God's love? Because there's a lot of it, right? There's a lot of love out there. And we learn best in the hardest of times. But see, here's the thing. As we realize more and more the power of Christ, what we understand is it's not God changing our circumstances that makes the difference. It's God changing us. That's what changes everything. That regardless of my circumstance, regardless of what is around me, regardless of what goes on, I am alive in Christ Jesus. Also, when we pray, God leads and we follow. Praying opens our eyes to God, right? That we can truly see the goodness of who he is and he leads us, right? He moves us. As I said, <coughs> excuse me, as I said already, prayer is active. It's moving. God leads and we follow. Look with me at verse 17 through 19. It says this. It says, And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the full measure of the fullness of God. When we pray, God leads and we follow. Our lives in Christ Jesus are to be rooted and grounded in love, right? The love that God first had for us. When we learn to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and all of our strength, then we can begin to love others. Then we can begin to shine his light. And the more that we experience it, the more that we reach out for it, the more that we grab a hold of it, and cling to his love, the more that we discover how much greater it is. And that's the beauty of Christ's love, is it is unending. And that he will carry us through all things. He's, God's love, it surpasses all of our knowledge and all of our understanding, and he reveals that love to us through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, our greatest hope is Christ in us, and working through us. That's our greatest hope. It's not something that I'm going to do. It's not something that you're going to do. It's what Christ has already done. And how wide and how deep and how high and how long is the love of Christ. And once we're saved, we can experience that love in a way that is beyond our imagination. Look at verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine according to his power that is work within you. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, this is, this is where it gets really exciting. Because see, when we pray, 
God sends us and we go. God sends us and they go. When we go, we, we, we devote our lives. We surrender our lives fully to him. We live our lives for the glory of Christ who abundantly gave us more than we could ever ask for or imagine and abundantly wants to work in and through us in ways that we could never ask for or imagine. If you would have asked me whenever I was younger if I would be up on the stage proclaiming Christ, I'd be like, you're crazy. I bet you as Melissa gets ready to go on her mission trip, if you were to ask her if she was ever going to go to the ends of the earth, she'd be like, you're nuts before Christ, right? There's no way. If you would have known Bob before Jesus, you'd have been like, man, he would not be an elder of a church. But see, here's the thing. None of us would be. In and of ourselves, we have nothing and we are nothing, but Christ is everything. And he fills us up. And I can look around this room. I can look at Seth. I can look at Tony. I can look at different people, Juliana. I can see how Christ has been transforming our hearts for his glory. And he sets us free, right? And he uses us. Not just a few of us, but every single one of us. Paul says in Philippians 1.27, he says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a worthy manner of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way. Whether we're together or we're separate, right? May we contend for the gospel of Christ. See, don't be disheartened even when you feel weak. Don't don't feel alone because you are never alone. God calls and we respond. God speaks and we listen. God leads and we follow and God sends and we go. And the disciples are standing there, as I said already, on the edge of that hill. They're just standing there waiting, right? And the, the angels appear and say, what are you doing? What are you still standing here? Didn't he already tell you what you're supposed to do, right? Pray. Be filled with his Holy Spirit. And go tell others about his love. See, we must look for God to work and use us. Jesus' return to the Father made a way for us to have the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of us. Jesus said this. He said, hey, you know what? You guys are going to do something more than I did. You're going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to give you the power to do that. So I've been praying a lot about our church, and we've been praying a lot about community and what it really means to come together in community groups and what it really means to be filled with the Spirit. Well, it all starts with prayer, us praying in our groups, us praying for God to lead us. Maybe God is leading you to start a group, and it's time for you to do that. (coughs) Wait. But... As we look at our life, how do we revitalize our church, right? How do we get over what we've gone through? How do we impact our community? How do we grow the way God wants us to? How do we mature as a family of God? Well, it starts with what? It starts with prayer and waiting on the Holy Spirit to fill us. Because if the Spirit doesn't fill us, if he doesn't lead us, we're not going to be able to take the good news to the world around us. But see, by our words, our walk, our community, and God's mighty works, we will take Jesus to the world. If we rely on him, if we cling to him. When we talk about church, we talk about how it's part of a movement and it's time to move. As Brandon said already, our lives are not meant to be what lived in isolation, right? We're called to take the good news to disciple one another, and to share it with the world. So it's time for us to get going for his glory. See, this is the common unity that we have in Christ Jesus. And this is our call to reach our community for his glory. Will you pray with me?
Father God, today we come before you, God, and we ask you to fill us. God, fill our eyes with the true picture of who you are. How you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross in our place, God. How you saw the depth of our sin, the the rebellion, God, the way that we turned against you, and yet you still loved us and you died for us. Open our eyes to the reality of your Holy Spirit that comes in and turns our lives upside down and changes us, God. God, it's not my my job to convict. It's not my job to convey. It's yours. You move. Speak to our hearts, God. There are some in this room that has never truly surrendered your life to you, and today is the day that they should do that. God, there's some in this room that haven't been living for your glory. Maybe they've been hurt. Maybe they've lost their way. Maybe they're just jaded by the world, God. Or maybe they're afraid. God, give them your strength and your power today. Help them to see and realize that they are filled to overflowing with you. And that as they go out in their homes, in their schools, in their lives and jobs, God, they're not going alone. They're going in the power of Christ. And that you haven't just called a few of us to go, God. You've called every one of us to shine your light. God, those that have been filled with your power, show your power. May we do that. God, we ask you today to forgive us where we fill you of our sin. God, we repent of those things and we turn to you and we ask you to lead us into something new, God. God, as we pray, we ask you to speak to our hearts. We ask you to call us, God. We ask you to to reveal to us where we should go. And may we follow you whether it's the first step of accepting you as Lord and Savior or it's the next step of honoring you with all that we have. May we do that every day of our life to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In your name we pray, amen.